Hey guys, I see Stephanie is standing by. Uh, invite uh, to stream. That should be. Have I done that right? Stephanie, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. I thought I would just add you immediately. Let's not waste any time. <laughs> All right. It's a it's a good chapter. Yeah, definitely is. Definitely is. Um, True Jedi forever. Good to see you, Nisi, PW. Have I missed anyone? Um, Robbie Robin is here. A couple of people in chat. So good to see you. So just a kind of a disclaimer. I didn't like prep Stephanie. I didn't coach her. We, in fact, we spoke virtually zero. I, I would pretty much say we didn't speak at all about this chapter. Right? Right. So fresh I'm going to kind of hand, sorry. I said it was a fresh read for me. Yeah. Did, did you say you read chapter 13? I was going to. I started it and then I saw you uh, were on last night for Barry Morphew. So I paused. The oh, so you, I actually pulled you out of that. Okay. A little bit. That's okay. Are you able to um, uh, move your, I don't know, camera so that our heads are at almost a similar level? Oh, I don't know. I think I'm short. Let me see. Otherwise, it's like I'm a towering above you. I'd rather not do that. Is that better? Okay, that's better. That is better. Okay. <laughs> I'll put up the painting that is, I think, the same one used beside the chapter, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is. So, so this is this is uh, chapter eleven, and as you can see, this picture here is the same as the one behind me, and it seems like he's sort of suggesting that when he spoke about the loneliness and whatever that that this is now coming to sort of fruition, kind of thing, right? Yes, these seem to be the paintings that he was working on when he was describing that feeling in his letter to his uh, brother yeah. and sister-in-law. Yeah. So did you write a script for yourself or, or, or not? <laughs> I did. It's pretty, I don't know. Yeah, I did. I, I can, I can. I wasn't sure if you were going to lead or I was going to lead, but I did um, write a, an outline. Okay. Uh, hi, Kathy. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Karina. Good to see you guys. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over to you. I want to. I don't want to. I don't want to influence what you say. So so, the floor is yours. Okay, we are looking at. Chapter 11, A Day Trip to Paris. July 6, 1890, Vincent left for Paris to visit his brother Theo and his family. It was a last minute decision after receiving a worrying letter from his brother who was facing a series of problems. Okay, so just to let folks know, Van Gogh, uh, sustained a bullet wound on the 27th of July. So literally, literally three weeks to the day. So he took this trip from Obesu was into Paris on a Sunday, three weeks to the day later, he sustained a, this gunshot wound, either by his own hand or somebody shot him. Um, And so the question you guys need to think about, we'll provide our opinions, is is this event on this particular Sunday, July 6th, relevant to what happened on the 27th of July? Uh, the letter that Theo wrote to Vincent was from uh, July, I guess that he wrote it July 30th, I mean, sorry, June 30th and July 1st, 1890. It's letter number 894. 
And in this letter, Theo described their anguish over baby Vincent's health, his almost continually, continual crying lasting several days and nights. And this is a quote from the letter that Theo wrote. Just a Vincent. second, Stephanie. Corinna says, can I turn Stephanie up? Can you, I don't know, do, do you mean the volume or do you mean something else? Like, um, I don't know, I'm not sure people can hear you so well. I can hear you fine. True Jedi Forever also says, can Stephanie's volume go up? I can try to talk louder. Okay. I can have you? my volume up as loud as You sound I normal can. to me. You sound... Sharon also says I can hear her. So, Corina says Stephanie is hard to understand. I don't know. If you can't hear Stephanie, try... Um, just refreshing, see if that works. Okay, Stephanie. So this is a excerpt from the letter 894 that Theo wrote to his brother Vincent prior to Vincent deciding to visit them in Paris. You've never heard anything as painful and us not knowing what to do and everything we do seeming to aggravate his suffering. Joe has been admirable, a true mother, but tired herself very much, too much even. May she recover her strength and not have any more ordeals to go through. If only the child who is sleeping might let her sleep for a few hours, both of them will wake with a smile, I hope. In general, Life is hard for her at the moment. And I wrote, they were both feeling, Joe and Thea were both feeling overwhelmed with their newborn's health issues, his needs, and the strain of adjusting to caring for a newborn. He wasn't drink. he was kind of colicky and having an allergy to cow's milk. And the doc, a doctor that they saw in regards to their their baby said that it was a result, likely a result of the way the cows are raised and treated in, in Paris, that they're not kept very healthy and that it's like giving baby Vincent poisons. That's hmm. what the doctor said. Do you remember what Dr. Gachet's prescription was? The whole family. To keep up with your day-to-day -day activity that you're already doing and to drink a lot of beer. Yeah. So does it seem like that worked? No. And Sharon, so, I mean, that was... I'm just trying to see when did they... When did, when did they do the trip into Orvez? Was that, um, I think it was also a Sunday. Um, let's see. Um, and I was just going to answer, Sharon was wondering why she didn't nurse the baby. Joe's milk wasn't coming in, so she wanted to. That was what she wanted to do, but her milk wasn't coming in, so she wasn't able to nourish her baby yeah. that way. So, and I think part of it yeah. was the stress of everything that they were going through might have been. And emotionally, she was also uh, going through what we know today as postpartum depression. Mm. So that could also be affecting her milk output. What you asked, when did they visit Van Gogh? Well, I've got the answer here. It was 8th of June. So it was approximately a month, a month earlier. But that was actually when... Um, it was around that time that, that I don't know if you remember, um, uh, Van Gogh kind of asked the doctor, can you, can you kind of help my brother and his wife? So, yes, so it's basically a month later and they're still sick. In other words, did the doctor help them answer no? The other thing, I don't want to interrupt you too much, but the other thing that's, I think, quite important to bear in mind here is, is 
who is actually having the problem here? It's actually his brother that's sick, his sister-in-law that's sick, and the baby that's sick. They are all not healthy and struggling, but everyone's like, no, 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 something is wrong with Vincent. Actually, he was very healthy. He wasn't sick. They were sick. And not only were they sick, they were sort of stressed. And uh, like it was kind of a triangle of stress. The baby was crying. The mother wasn't sleeping. The husband was worried about money and about his job. And so it was this triangle of misery, basically. And Vincent was like, I don't know what I can do to help, but blah, blah, blah. And so it's just quite important to bear that in mind. It's like, who is actually sick in this, in this, who was in trouble and who is actually apparently fine kind of thing. Yeah, at this point, Vincent was the most well and healthy seeming of his, his family that he was corresponding yeah. with. He was the most healthy, <clears throat> which is part okay. of the reason why he was trying to encourage them to come to the countryside even during his visit and after when he left. Ironically, if you know, if you take what you said there about if it's true that the doc, the, the the cow's milk in Paris was not really very really good, well, then theoretically, if they did spend a bit of time in Auvergne, they would have had country country milk from country cows. Who knows? That may have actually done the trick. Who knows? So they were using donkey milk, and I guess that was oh, oh, oh. helping a little oh, bit with that's... the baby. Oh, okay. And while uh, Thea was writing Vincent just a few weeks before that, Joe was actually writing her sibling. I think her, I'm not sure how to say her name is Mian, 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 Joe's sister. I think it's Mean. Writing... Mean, okay. So Joe was um, talking to her, oh, voicing her concerns for Mean, um, to Mean about Theo. So Theo's sharing his concerns about Joe to his brother, and she's sharing her concerns to her sister, her sibling as well. She told Mean that Theo continued to suffer from a long-term cough. He looks very bad, very bad, shivers constantly, and has little appetite. He was very ill and overworked. And that and was so, likely... Sorry, just, just for context, Theo actually died six months later. So it wasn't like this wasn't like a little cold or something. So it's obviously a sign that he's health in general wasn't that great anyway. At this point, it, it looks like Theo's disease progression, if they both did in fact have it, was more advanced or yeah. um, you know, more symptomatic than Vincent's. Bear in mind, Theo is in Paris. Brothels are in Paris. Uh, Vincent's been in Saint-Rémy for a year. There are not really any brothels there. And I don't know if there's too much in that sort of thing in Auvers either, but you kind of get the idea that Vincent has kind of gone on the straight and narrow and Theo maybe not so much in that sense. On page 97, Bailey wrote a quote that was a response from Vincent to Theo's letter about his struggles. And he said, I'd very much like to come and see you. And what holds me back is the thought that I'd be even more powerless than you are in the given state of distress. And I think Vincent was worried about aggravating his Theo and his family's troubles. He didn't wanna be more of a burden to them with all that they were going through, but he ended up deciding to make that trip. And they all, he also, when he arrived there, his, there were a number of friends that were coming to visit him. 
So when, so before Vincent went into the asylum, he, he did, he had a num a number of friends that he was communicating with. It wasn't like he was isolated. Is that your, what you, your thought was? I think Nick got cut, <laughs> bumped out. Can chat see and hear me? Sharon, it, oh, okay, thank you. I don't know if I should just go on or, or wait for him. The first visitor that he had was an art cr critic that had, oh, I think I'm getting a message from him, hold on. The first a visitor that he had was an art critic, and it was someone who, just before he had left the asylum, welcome back, Nick. <laughs> I didn't know if I would keep on being. I'm glad you did because I didn't you. know what happened on my side. I mean, I'm like, okay. Well, I, guess I was just like, a duh, saying nothing, but <laughs> <laughs> you're back. And the art critic had given him very positive reviews and Vincent was quite reluctant to accept them. And he had given him a portrait landscape that he'd been saving for over a year as a thank you. And that was Cypress's. So just before he had left the asylum, he was gaining confidence in himself that even art critics were giving positive reviews of his work. That was his first visitor. It was, um, I think the gentleman's name was uh, Albert Aurier. Albert Aurier, yes. And he, yeah. he published the first substantial review of Vincent's work. So he had a visit from him and they probably discussed more of his artwork and his paintings and the next person that came to visit was Henri de Toulouse Latre. Is that how you say it? All these. Uh, no, Henri de Toulouse, Toulouse Latre. Yeah. yeah. And that was someone he got to know when he was in Paris a few years earlier. And I guess my impression is he had kind of a vulgar or morbid sense of humor mm. and uh, Vincent just went along with it probably to distract himself from the concerns of what was happening with his brother-in-law and I mean his brother and sister-in-law if you had, remember the context of this painting it was he felt extreme loneliness etc cetera, etc cetera, right so here is a here is a event that takes place halfway through the summer epic, right? Halfway through those 70 days where he sees one friend after another. It's like this social gathering. He sees Albert Aurier and, and this guy's like quite a, you know, it's not just uh, an acquaintance. Well, it's someone who can talk about his work. Then it's this other friend. It's not like a little acquaintance either. It's an old friend. Yeah. Then there's also, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, a friend of Joe, Sarah de Swart, and then Joe's brother, Andres Bonga. So you have these four people pitching up. So it's this very social gathering. So the last thing you would have felt is feeling of loneliness, you know. Right. He's with friends and family halfway through this, this epic kind of thing. Yeah. In fact, he, 
he was scheduled to see even more visitors, mm -hmm. but that was after he had a, a um, I think a confrontation with his family. He decided not to yeah. meet up with more of them. Yeah. And I okay. was wondering, I was wondering after the, the sculptor left, her name was Sarah DeSwart, who was a friend of Joe's who Vincent appreciated her, her, her work. Joe's brother joined the discussion. Was he just a visitor or was he a business partner in business with the paintings? Because um, he seemed to be a part of their conversation and discussions. And I wasn't sure if maybe Joe wanted someone there who she thought was of sound mind and could be more rational. So she called in her brother to kind of be neutral. It could have been. It could also be that her brother kind of took over in a way that wasn't good for anybody. But it seems from what I understand... Andres kind of was trying to influence Theo to, to go in a totally different direction, you know, like to quit his job and they were going to, they were going to kind of become partners or something. And, and I think this frightened Vincent because it was like, if you quit your job, I'm maybe going to be in jeopardy. First of all, you may not be getting a salary anymore. You know what I mean? Second of all, um, I, I'm, even though I haven't sold anything, my chance of selling anything is now even lower. You know what I mean? So I think Vincent, you could say quite selfishly, but in another way you could say understandably felt imperiled and felt vulnerable by this in influence on his brother that is now possibly going to... Um, threaten his stability and his livelihood reliance on his brother in a way. Yeah, he was dependent on Theo because Theo was presenting and trying to sell his work uh, in the art gallery that he had. And if Vincent was on his own, that's a big risk. And I think that okay, was keep probably going. a source of one of their their disagreements was Theo deciding to go off on his own and making yeah. the decision and Vincent not being very happy about it. And I think that was an addition to Vincent seeing his brother and his family unwell and wanting them to come be with him in the countryside to mm -hmm. have the fresh air and he said that children don't get sick like this where I am. And he was trying to convince them to join. I just think it was very nerve wracking time with major life decisions that were being presented. There's quite a lot going on. You had three people who were un unwell. They're thinking of changing jobs. They're also thinking of changing apartments. Vincent was also moaning about... He didn't like where his pictures were being kept. And now they were talking about they're going to go to a larger apartment. And so it's all in all happening at the same time. I mean, each of those things on its own is quite a big thing. Changing jobs is big. Moving apartments is big. Um, your whole family being sick is big, but all of these at the same time. And so it's, you kind of just get a sense of chaos. All of these things are happening. And then these friends are coming over and it's just kind of this kind of mayhem at the same time. And Vincent van Gogh goes into this mayhem and he's, he's not a, he's not, he's sort of used to being alone and he's used to sort of being solitary. Suddenly it's this cacophony of chaos and, mm -hmm. you know, it's a bit unsettling for him. What's quite interesting on page 99 is they talk about, and this is Joe saying this. Theo was again considering the old plan of leaving Goupil um, and setting up a business for himself. So this wasn't the first time he thought of doing it. And um, I don't know whether I must cut to the chase here 
um, maybe I, maybe I must just first let you finish. I, I just hope I don't forget. Um, but anyway, keep going. You you can go ahead if you want. I'm, um, I'm getting... Okay, I'm just scared I'm going to forget to say this. Yeah. So, bottom line is, he never did leave Gupil. So his brother thought of leaving Gupil. There was this stress and, and all this stuff. Um, and ultimately, it was sort of resolved. The family got well. Um, it, there was this big stress, we're going to leave, he's going to change jobs. It ultimately, never did. So, you know, I think what art historians and all these people, when the case they're trying to make is, at this moment, Van Gogh got very stressed, and the stress just got worse and worse, and he committed suicide. My point is, yes, it was stressful, but it was resolved. It wasn't like his brother did change jobs. He thought of changing jobs. And Joe says it was an old plan. They, they thought of doing it quite a few times. The thing you guys in chat need to think about is, you might disagree with me and might say, you know what, Vincent was very, very fragile mentally. This would break him like a twig and it was just downhill from there and then, you know, there's no turning back on a thing. You're welcome to have a difference of opinion. Um, the question is, is that a reasonable assumption to make given um, what we know? And this certainly is a setback. It's not, we've talked about him being happy and content and motivated and all those things. This wasn't a happy day for him. But did it, was it the straw that broke the camel's back? After, the day after Vincent left Paris, Theo actually did confront the, uh, the gentleman that he worked for, but he, he didn't, he voiced his thoughts and they kind of ridiculed him, but then they ultimately, he, he didn't go off on his own. Like you said, he, it was just a very, very anx anxiety ridden time for mm -hmm. the family. And they did, they, they were making the decision to move to a bigger apartment to house more of Vincent's work. And Vincent wasn't very happy about how his work was being stored because it was kept under beds in their small apartment. Yeah. And it was yeah. also stored in a, a gentleman, Per Tangue's art supply shop. And there mm. it was, it's, noted that it was riddled with with bed bugs so that's not oh, okay. a very good way to store your artwork so then so the, so they did end up wanting to move to a bigger apartment mm. so there's a quote on let me see on page 100 and it was a draft of a letter that that Vincent wrote to Theo and Joe and he says we're all a little dazed and I imagine this is after their argument over their livelihood and their health you surprise me a little seeming to want to force the situation being in disagreement can I do anything about it? Perhaps not. But have I done something wrong? And it says the precise meaning of these words remains unclear. What, what do you think those words mean? I think this just shows Vincent van Gogh as a sensitive guy. Uh, maybe a bit of paranoia there, um, but... I'm not saying he wasn't justified in being worried, but I think at the same time he was kind of overthinking it, I think, because as we know, ultimately his brother didn't leave. You know, and I think it's a little bit of a situation like this. This is kind of a family matter between Theo, his wife, and 
his wife's brother. And Vincent's now coming into it and he's, you can kind of imagine he's the older brother actually as well. And he's kind of feels like he's losing control. And he's also kind of seeing things much further down the, the line that, and the alarm bells are going off. And they're trying to say to him, listen here, just calm down. We're not sure what we're going to do. And he's reading that as, oh, shit, this is not, this is not going to end well. I've got a bad feeling about this. And they're saying, calm down. We're just throwing around some ideas. And he's almost reading that as, you, you're not actually trusting me. You're not telling me the truth. I'm, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's kind of like a situation of being in a bit of a limbo. It's like we need to make a change, but you're not quite sure when or where. And he's kind of panicking. He's like, um, I need certainty right now. And they're like, well, we're not quite sure what you're going to do. And he, he's reading that as the, what do you call it? The, um, the die is cast kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And... So let me just look at this. Um, so what I think is quite important to bear in mind is, is he is a sensitive guy and he, he realizes there's some acrimony, he realizes there's some argument and he's trying to broker it. He's not just like this bull in a china shop. He's quite sensitively kind of saying, um, you know what, this is how I feel. Once again, he's communicating his feelings. Um, he's also being quite considerate. He's saying, you know what, we're all a little bit dazed. We're all kind of like dazed and confused by what's going on. And then he says, um, why, why do you want to like force the situation? Why do you like, you know, in terms of leaving good pill, you know, why do you want to, force this change like if you fire that's one thing but why do you want to leave you know why do you want to have to change something um bear in mind for him it's like my brother has a job with gupil and almost like via that i get taken care of it's not strictly speaking true but because my brother's taken care of i'm taken care of um and so in a way he's a little bit selfish because it's like I want you just to be stable so that I'm stable. But he's not really thinking, well, is, is his brother, is it really the best thing for his brother? You know, he's kind of thinking, I need this kind of thing. Yeah. But bear in mind, he never actually sends the letter. That's another thing. He writes the letter, he communicates these things, and then decides, I'm going to be fiddling too much in their salad. I'm not even going to send the letter. So the fact that he doesn't even send the letter shows that is quite emotionally mature. He's not just like totally reactionary and going off the deep end. He's feeling things and he's communicating them and he decides, I'm actually going to hold this back. And that shows you he's got some resilience, right? Mm -hmm. um, he also says, can I do anything about it? Maybe not. But have I done something wrong? Um Bear in mind, he has come from the space of scandal. You know, he's missing an ear. He's not a success. And he's he's kind of trying to be on the same level. You know, um, he has my advice. But in a way, he's not on the same level. He's kind of this needy, dependent, uh, scandalized brother. You know what I mean? So, so... Um, I think on, in, in, the, in one sense, he's quite a confident guy, but on the other hand, he realizes he is actually powerless. You know, he is actually, I don't know, sometimes in a family dynamic, you'll see one person can talk to another family member, and there, there'll be a result. Another person falls completely on deaf ears. But he's also like the odd man out. There's Thea, yeah. there's Joe. There's Joe's brother, and then there's it's all kind of them and yeah. him trying to show the other side, and it was definitely yeah. extremely tense. So I agree with Bailey when he says, 
exactly what was going on is unclear, but it was definitely emotionally disturbing. I agree with him 100% with that, that that was emotionally disturbing. It definitely unsettled him. Mm -hmm. The question funny. is, the question is, how much? Um, you know, if, if if the pond of his mind was, was quite tranquil, was did this now create a tsunami or did it create little ripples? What are we talking about here? And just to reiterate, his family is sick. Not him. He's not. He's not actually. His health is fine. Also, his brother wants to change his job. He's not saying, wow, I'm having this existential crisis. I think I'm going to stop painting. It's all happening to somebody else. All he's got to do is react to it in a certain way. And the two things I want to mention is, first of all, he writes this letter and decides I'm not even going to send it. So could it have been that horrible? Like, it's like that urgent, and then he, he doesn't actually send the letter that he wrote. The other they thing... Yeah. Do they find a draft of it? Does he draft all his letters? If he no, I don't think he drafts all of them. I, I think they found it in his desk. Afterwards, like, you know, yeah. Um, the I think the 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 thing you quoted from the uh, opening chapter, mm -hmm. I think that is actually a letter he wrote subsequently, and uh, it kind of to me, contaminates the whole chapter. So where he says, I'd very much like to come and see you, and what holds me back is the thought that I'd be even more powerless than you are, right, in the given state of distress. Now, like, alarm bells are going off. Well, Vincent van Gogh's losing it. He's, he's tumbling down the spiral staircase into despair. But the fact is, this he wrote this letter after the visit to Paris, and his his position I, I, is, yeah. I thought it was written. I'll I'll have to double check because I have it that it was written July second, eighteen. Oh, is it? Let um, me it check. Was a, it was a response to Theo telling him okay. all their health problems. But I I may be I may be mistaken. No, I, saying, I could also I, be mistaken. He says, I'd very much like to come and see you. But, I mean, then he does go and see him, so. Yeah, he does, um, he does try to. Chapter 11, all. number one, let's just have a look. You're right, letter dated 2nd July, 1890. Um, the part that I've highlighted here, so... You know, he says, I'd very much like to come and see you. And then, but what holds me back is um, that I'd be more powerless. And then he does actually go and visit. Right? Yeah. He goes anyway. Um, but the, the part that I'm highlighted is where he says, what holds me back. Mm -hmm. Right? And so he um, feels like, I don't know if I can contribute. And then, but then he does go after all. Right? And I don't know whether he, I think in a weird way, what he fears does kind of happen. He goes there and he does feel powerless. He, he goes there and he does feel like, I can't make you healthy. You want to change jobs. I can't do anything about that. Um, it does kind of come from the situation and add stress yeah. to, the, to them. I, I think that sense of feeling powerless is where he actually realizes he doesn't have much social influence over them. Um, he's kind of dependent. His status is kind of quite low in a way. And also he's he's been out of the dynamic for a long time. And he, he, he I think he kind of thinks he can just step in or he realizes he can't just step in and pull the shots or whatever. And, yeah, and that, that's kind of holding him back. So he, so he does go, and then they have their chaotic, tension-filled discussion, argument, and then Vincent storms off. 
he mm. leaves up and leaves suddenly. And Joe said it it had become too much for Vincent. He was overtired and excited. And then that's if when you he take... went back yeah. and he calms down, reflected, wrote his response, held on to it. And then in, while while he was feeling all these overwhelming feelings, he was painting. He couldn't stay away from painting. Corinna says, Stephanie Eagle Eye Award once again. Oh. <laughs> Nisi teamwork. says, by going, hey? It's teamwork. <laughs> we, <laughs> you yeah. remind me of things and... Goes yeah. Away. Nisi says, by going, although powerless... Does that show his dependence? Um, I, I think, think the fact that he returns in a state of despair um, shows that he's, in a way, emotionally dependent. He's not, he's not independent. He's not in a strong position. He feels vulnerable. Um, I think his if actually you, if you, if you take okay. I was going to say I think him actually deciding to go just shows how much invested he had in his brother and family and how much he cared. He cared enough yeah. to go anyways. Yeah, I think you I think the point I was trying to make was that he is aware of what's going on with his brother. And on the 2nd of July, he actually says, um, I'd like to come and see you, but but I'm not. You know, that that's kind of like his, his initial thing. So yeah. it's like, I'd like to come and see you, but I don't think I can do anything. In other words, he's almost dissociated. He's almost like saying, I can't do anything. You, you, you're on your own in a way. And then he realizes, well... I better come and come over, and and um, to to say I don't know. Like on the one hand, you could say the fact that he initially says I'm not going to come and see you. You could say it's not bothering him that much. If, if, you know what I mean? Um, on the other hand, you can say it it did bothering him so much, which is why he went there. Yeah, that's right? what I I lean towards. But but it still comes down to is he um, unhinged because of this? Like, so what is your impression in terms of that? Hey, Susan when, Becker, good to see you. When he when he left, when he left, was he unhinged? I think he was emotional. I think he took us. He said, "I ha I have to leave. I need space." I, I'm not okay. helping. This isn't being sorted out. I don't think that he was unhinged. And what does he do? I don't think so either. Like, um, he, gets back, he starts painting again to, to yeah. uh, release his emotions. That's part of how he helps calm himself is by expressing himself that way. Same that he did with the letter, expressing himself. And then yeah. when he receives a letter from Joe... He responds very tenderly back to her. Um, now that's also quite important is Joe reaches out to him and he writes back to Joe as well. And that's also that letter is also a favored aspect that the art historians like to use to say, can you see he was he was uh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. The part that I think a lot of people miss is this happened on the 6th of July, not not like a day before he died or a week before he died. It happened three weeks. It's quite a long time. And so exactly as you say, if this was so terrible, so devastating, this is almost halfway through the summer epic. So you'd say, oh, okay, so I guess he stopped painting then. You know, he, was, he suddenly felt so horrible that he – it just 
caved in and so then he stopped painting but he didn't stop painting so um but but this is very much part of what the art historians use to say can you see he was totally depressed he was this this was the straw that broke the camel's back and it's like so his brother wanted to leave but then he didn't leave What's so devastating about that? His family was sick, but then they, they weren't sick anymore and they went on holiday. What's so horrible about that? Um, he had reasons to feel feel sad and upset. Those are those are legitimate reasons that he yeah. he felt upset. But he he dealt with his feelings as Vincent has done all along by expressing himself. I kind of get the feeling one of the biggest blows to him was he really, really, really wanted, for example, his family to come visit him in Orbez. He wanted it to happen again. If I'm not mistaken, they only visited him once. Correct. Right? Definitely. They only came that one time, which is not much. And so, yeah, Vincent's visiting them. That's kind of the second time, but it doesn't go very well. And then the other thing is, Part of the reason why they didn't come visit him, besides being sick and stressed, was they were about to go on holiday and they were going to go to their mother, to Vincent's mother. And I think he kind of felt, well, um, I, I'm really, I really need to be with my family and you going to other family. And so he's powerless in terms of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Can I read the excerpt of Joe's Part of Joe's letter? Yeah, sure. Is this page so, 101? Yes. Actually, it's it's um, Vincent's response to her letter. I don't know okay. that they have... I think that's another missing... This is... Int it's interesting that Vincent wrote a letter. He didn't send it. They learned about the letter because it was referenced by Theo in the letter to to his mother and Will at the end of August. But the very page of Theo's letter that that tells about that and summarizes Vincent's letter appears to be destroyed or lost by the family. So that page is missing. So it's quite it's, crucial as well. It's quite crucial that yeah, that particular be like a lot of important mm. pieces of the puzzle not there for whatever reason. Um, so so Joe uh, wrote Vincent a letter, and then Vincent's reaction was that her letter letter was like a gospel for me a deliverance from anguish, which I was caused by the rather difficult and laborious hours for us all. Vincent continued that his life felt attacked at the very root. He then added, once back here, I too still felt saddened and had continued to feel the storm that threatens you also weighing upon me. I feared that I was a danger to you living at your expense. But Joe's letter clearly proves to me that you really feel that for my part, I am working and suffering like you. So it, he felt validation. Mm. So often the art historians will quote this and they'll say, um, they'll say, they'll say the following. I too felt very saddened, almost like I felt depressed. I continue to feel the storm that threatens you also weighing upon me. I feared that I was a danger to you living at your expense. And then I'll stop it right there. So it's like, wow. And I've heard, I've heard this over and over again. Uh, Vincent van Gogh committed suicide because he felt it was this terrible burden to his family. So it's like, so you committed suicide because you didn't want to be a burden anymore. That committing suicide would make you not a burden. Okay, that makes sense. 
But anyway, in terms of this letter, he says, all of that, I feared, I feared this, I feared that, I was worried I was a danger to you, but Joe's letter clearly proves to me that you really feel that I'm not a burden. And, you know, so he's saying, well, thanks, your letter delivered me from that anguish. He's saying, and the other thing, just to, to reiterate, is once again, he's communicating his feelings. He's saying, I felt very sad. I felt worried. I was I was scared that I was a danger to you. All these things is communicating. So, so why would he not communicate a week, two, three weeks later to say, well, you know what, I was very sad, now I'm even sadder, and I just can't convince myself that I'm that I'm not a burden. I just can't take it anymore. Why does he write this very emotional letter at an emotionally disturbing time on July 6th, around that time, but he doesn't write it when he wants to commit suicide. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So it's Nisi definitely. says, I think if... Yeah. Sorry, I just want to read you. Nisi says, I think if he felt a burden, he wouldn't kill himself. He would use the one thing he had, his ability to paint for money for the family. Yeah. Um, for me, it's quite a difficult one because I don't know if Van Gogh knew how not to be a burden because he was actually a burden to everyone wherever he went. When he went to all, it's almost like he burned the house down, the, the, the people of all kicked him out. When he was at saint Rami, it was like, can I please have some wine and please leave me alone so I can faint. You know, um, when he lived with his parents, they, they, he still sort of complained. They, cheat, they treat me like a shaggy dog, you know, with a sort of, you know, um, I guess we've got to put up with this this creature. But yeah. everywhere he went, he was a burden. And, and it, even though he was sensitive about it, he was nevertheless a burden. He would nevertheless continue being a burden. So, you know, he wasn't going to stop painting. He wasn't going to say, Theo, um, does it bother you that I paint and I don't sell anything? And let's say Theo had said, Actually, it does. I, I don't really like that you never, ever sell your art. Can you please stop? That was never going to happen. Right. He was going to, he, he'd actually resolved in his mind that I'm going to keep painting even if I don't sell anything and I'm, that's fine. You know, that's my fate kind of thing. Um, so, so he was, and, and this is the other thing. Um, I, I thought the quote at the top of page 100 is quite, quite significant. Um, this is Bailey's words. Uh, Bailey writes, quote, Theo was being squeezed financially since he not only provided Vincent with a regular allowance, but also partially supported their mother and now had a wife and child to support. He agonized over whether to issue an ultimatum to his bosses, raise my salary or I will leave and set up my own gallery. Theo was uncharacteristically angry and resentful, blah, blah, blah. The, and he even like wrote to Vincent calling his co-workers rats. Those rats, Bouchard and Valadon, treat me like blah, 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 blah. But this is the part, again, if you haven't been paying attention or you don't know what we're talking about, um, you can't say that Theo was being squeezed financially in terms of Vincent because Vincent had an inheritance that was set aside for him. So unless you kind of suddenly have amnesia where you're like, oh, I didn't know that he's getting inheritance money, you could say, well, yeah, there's, was he paying, was he sort of looking after Vincent out of his own pocket? No, he wasn't. He was, he had Actually, Vincent's money. Yeah, it was already there. So, I have, um, yeah. I have the same exact thing written on mine at the top. I wrote false. He was not supporting Vincent, exclamation mark. Yeah, yeah well <laughs> said, well done, yeah. And so, I think that the yeah. quote that we were just discussing, that you said people who may support the suicide narrative leave out that but is, ve is very similar to the chapter that we discussed last time, the vast wheat fields, where he talks about the extreme loneliness, and then that's what they write. And they leave out the, 
the but, what I can't say in words, is what I consider healthy and fortifying about the countryside. Absolutely, yeah. So that's why that, that's when, a great analogy. Yeah. yeah. When we discuss how, at least for me, how I'm trying to figure out what I believe. When I read it, and and you as well, the little excerpts from the book or from letters, I don't leave out the other side. I still mm. we still share both, and then yeah, yeah. talk it out about wh why that may not be exactly what was meant. Yeah, I think two there are two or three big tests here. The one is so just in a very global way, you can say, so So Vincent, around this time, the first week of July, he was kind of upset. He was kind of emotional. Then you say, so we know that. Did he, did he express that? Did he say anything about that? And the answer is yes. The answer is you had letters that, that, that um, record that, and it's, it's not like, He's um, out of control or he's, he can't express his feelings. It's, it's not like he um, put like a thousand exclamation marks, like, I am just so upset I can't actually even write a letter. He writes this letter and, he, and it's quite, um, um, what's the word? It's eloquent and it's measured. He doesn't accuse anyone. He doesn't, he's, he's actually quite well mannered in his sort of disagreement, and um, they are very kind of uh, conciliatory. Very for, for yeah. Yeah. Um, the words he uses here, I've got to admit, um, do feel quite, um, it's, it's not like, it's not like this is just a little thing. You know, if he says, he even says um, his life feels attacked at the very root. And I actually watched a um, I watched a movie this afternoon on Netflix. I think it's called Against the Ice. Have you seen it? Yeah. And so what's quite amazing with this movie is if you don't want to hear spoilers, maybe you should just turn the volume down for a while. By the way, Jean is here. Jean says it's snowing in Boulder. And I've actually just looked at a couple of um, photos of Alec Baldwin giving his speech in Boulder and laughing, kind of leaning back, laughing. Um, but um, oh, and somebody else said that, th that their son bumped into Alec Baldwin in Boulder. So 15-year-old son, I think. So it's quite interesting. Um, it's quite interesting that, sorry, it's a bit of change of subject, but Jean says it's snowing in Boulder. It's rained the entire day here. It's actually been a weirdly cold day. I actually wore my winter slippers today. Um, didn't go out at all. Um, so maybe it's so cold in Boulder that cold has even come here. We actually have sunshine and it's like 45 degrees today, which is. Oh, nice. okay. Um, you know what's crazy is sunshine. Oh, that's cool. Maybe not. I, I can't show you out my window because it's dark outside, but you know it's quite funny. I started my day with a live. So my day when you saw me on the live, that was like five o'clock yeah. this morning. <laughs> and I'm ending my day with a live. I mean, right now it's half past nine. So now you get a sense of my time relative to your time. Yeah. I was going to bed after yours. You were going to the gym. And yeah. then now you're getting ready to cycle down and I'm Absolutely, ready to yeah. go out yeah. <laughs> after. Yeah. Uh, Jean says about four inches of snow and 21 degrees. That is pretty cold. Uh, Nisi says it's also snowed in in Arizona. So um, he also felt guilty about failing to sell his work and being a burden on Theo. But the fact is he always not sold his work. So this isn't something new. Um, for, you know, if you take Brian Laundry for example, um, 
if Brian Laundry had, I don't want to be too extreme, but let's say five girlfriends or ten girlfriends, and and then he broken up with each one, and then then he broke up with Gabby or Gabby broke up with him. Do you think he would have committed suicide? If he had 10 girlfriends? If he had 10 girlfriends? If, if Brian had, if Brian had um, been in love many times, he'd had quite a few girlfriends, he'd been in love and, you know, maybe been engaged even a couple of times, yeah. do you think he would have committed suicide? I don't think so. I think he was heavily invested in Gabby. So one of the th things with suicide and corresponds to murder is, you kind of have a unique set of circumstances that aggravate, right? It's a unique set of circumstances. It's not something that you've dealt with over and over again. You might say if someone's having an affair and they continue having the affair, well, that's, that's like a repetition of something, but an affair can build up and build up in terms of the Morphew case, for example. An affair can become... You, you have a little bit of suspicion, then the suspicions gets worse, then the feelings get stronger and stronger. All of that is a unique, one unique situation, right? Yeah. Do you follow what I, I'm saying? I do, I do. I also, I think that Gabby and Brian were very young. They didn't have life experience with other yeah. partners. So to them, it was the end of the, the world to think about not being with each other. They hadn't experienced being with other people. So if you take that idea that Brian isn't, hasn't had lots of practice with being engaged to someone and then it doesn't work out, now it's this unique critical thing that he, he doesn't really have the tools to deal with. With Van Gogh, he'd, he'd never sold his work. So that wasn't new. He'd been lonely for years. That wasn't new either. Um, he'd been in much worse shape than this but when he'd lost his ear. You know, how, I mean, if you take any person, imagine if you lose your ear, you know, um, you, your looks are kind of ruined. Um, that, that alone would be pretty depressing. You know, you've just lost your ear and your best friends abandoned you and you're far from home and you, you admit yourself to an asylum. That was much worse than, consider all of those things. And yeah, it's like, well, I'm thinking of losing, I'm, I'm thinking of leaving my job. Well, okay, I'm, I'm going to commit suicide because I think I'm a burden to you. I mean, it was a huge burden when he lost his ear. His brother, brother had to come all the way from Paris. To his whole family. To, yeah. So, and also, and I will get to this, when Van Gogh does get shot, his brother has got to leave Paris and sit by his bedside for for many hours, and then and then pay for and plan the funeral, and and then I mean, and then his brother dies six months later. Do you, don't you know? Like if you just think of it in a basic way, if Van Gogh didn't want to be a burden to his brother, the fact that he did die, don't you think he that was a burden? Don't you think that that did affect his brother? Don't you think that? The, the stress his brother was already going through was worsened by that. So Van Gogh thinking, I don't want to be a burden, so I think by killing myself I won't be a burden. I don't think that makes sense to, I don't think that would have made sense to him. Yeah. But no, let me ask you, Stephanie, if, if you were in Van Gogh's shoes, would you have thought, if I'm dead I won't be a burden anymore? You know, so I'll die, and then and then you must bury me, and there'll be the scandal of how I died, and um, you know, you'll have to come and do all those things. Compared to, okay, if I don't want to be a burden, what can I do to not be a burden? I won't ask for so much paint supplies. I'll paint smaller paintings. I'll, um, you know, there's all sorts of things that he could do. Yeah. To not be a burden. I don't think that... Or babysit Vincent. <laughs> you know, like the way he did previously with Chasing the Ducks. I'll, I'll do some babysitting for you. I'll, I'll bring 
country milk from the cows, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to bring it in, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, to me, um, the bottom line, Bailey himself actually writes, it's this last paragraph on page 101, it's how he wraps up the chapter. He says, quote, Vincent's reaction to these problems, if I, if I don't even read the rest, I'm going to read the rest in a second, but what do you think Vincent's reaction was to these problems? Was it that he got depressed? Was it that he went to Dr. Gachet and said, Cheapest, please give me some foxgloves. I give me some foxglove tea. I can handle this. Did he start drinking? Did he start swearing at someone? Did he cause arguments with other people? Did he stop writing to his brother? Did he, um, you know, um, did he set his clothes on fire? Uh, you know, did did he? Was there like some kind of big dramatic thing that happened? No, he wrote a couple of letters, and he said. I feel relief. Thanks so much. Okay, now I feel better. So, so how can you take that and say this? Um, you know. So anyway, let me just read the rest. He says Vincent's reaction to these problems was to channel his energy into his art. So Vincent's reaction to all of this was okay. I'm going to carry on painting. He was painting before, and he painted afterwards. Okay, so. Could it have been like that bad if it, you. Eh? Like the painting behind you. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said advice that he had also received from Dr. Gachet. Working at frenetic speed and with great emotion, he completed three large landscapes in three days. So, it's, so like over the next three days, he actually, if anything, his output was almost even better. It was like he, and I mean, to me, I've got this painting in my, this picture in my bedroom, not because I, I don't look at that picture and go, wow, I feel terribly emotional that I don't want to get out of bed. To me, it's like a beautiful picture. It's vivid. It's moving. It's uh, got energy in it. Um, and then it says here, the act of painting these immense stretches of wheat fields helped calm him by absorbing his emotion. So, so my question is, if, Bailey was sort of standing, you know, or if he was in chat, I, I would have said, okay, but if he was calmed down by that, then what's the problem here? So, you know, if you're going to make, and Bailey does make the case that Van Gogh committed suicide, if you're going to make the case that he's committed suicide, when are you going to start making that case? Because you haven't made it yet. Even Bailey in this chapter doesn't really say, oh, Cheap as this really set him back and he just never recovered. He says he was calmed down and he quotes the letter from Joe as being a relief. And um, the other thing that I just want to kind of um, emphasize here is Vincent's upset. And it's not like his family say, you know what, we are sick and tired of your drama, just Go and sort yourself out. He's getting support. They are, they treat him well and they treat him with respect and they treat him with kindness. And so quite soon this this dramatic episode is sort of dealt with. And that, that is why it's so, um, for me, wrong and so mischievous that you have people saying, yes, no, he was suicidal. And you know what he said? He said, I feel my, like, like my life is attacked at the very root. And he, and he said that just, just before he died. No, he said it in like three weeks earlier and then it was all resolved. So you can't use that. You really can't use that. And if you look at EndNote um, after that quote 20, it says yeah. that in addition to the wheat field under thunder clouds, he also painted wheat field with crows and Dobigny's Dob garden. So Dobigny's garden, yeah. Yeah. So those paintings, if they were painted in those three days, that painting was him working out his emotions. It's not the turmoil at the end. Yeah. No, so, so 
Uh, that's such a fantastic point, uh, Stephanie. Um, I, I obviously went to France and I went to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And when they, like, it's, it's, it's difficult to overemphasize what I'm about to say. When they try and tell Van Gogh's story, then the very last painting, so you, you'll have a painting and a little bit of script, painting and script, painting and script. Well, guess which painting is right at the end of that whole narrative? The dark one. Wheat filled with crows. Yeah, the one they considered. So, so, so they kind of say, this is the, the uh, uh, I can't remember if they, they. So that was actually painted the beginning of July. Yeah, which was actually painted around about not 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 um, July, somewhere July, around July. the 9th of July. Yeah, so I mean, it was painted. He still lived two weeks after he painted that painting, but that painting is is kind of put up as the last painting he painted, and then he died. In fact, in Lust for Life, they actually have been painting the painting, and then. And then crows fly into him. It's, it's just absolutely absurd. But um, over and over and over again, that painting is shown as this artwork that is showing that he is. Um, there's, there's, I mean, it's blackbirds on a yellow field showing. Oh, he's really. Um, he's, he's telling people that it's like his suicide note. Well, it's not the last painting that he painted. And, and if you look at the other one he painted, it's not dark. The how yeah. do you say it again? Dob Dobney's Garden. The big knees, yeah. The big knees. Yeah, well, it looks dark, but it's it's not. Yeah, it's, it's quite a it's quite a um um lively scene. Isn't there also a cat in it? There's a cat in it. There's a woman in it. There's yeah buildings in it. Flowers. The the sky looks soft. Yeah. So, so just for those who don't know, this is, that is wheat filled with crows. This one over here. Um, there. Looks so a lot darker here the than... Museum, that's the one they show last to you? In yeah, so when I, when, when I was at the Van Gogh Museum, um, that's like the, the final picture, and, and then they, they say something like... Um, I, don't, I can't remember if they say this is the last picture he painted or this is one of the last pictures he painted. I'm, I'm like, um, you can't really say that. There were other pictures he painted after this. But because it's like got this sort of ominous thing, the crows, crows are, are hobbingers of yeah. doom or whatever. I mean, I used the raven in um, the mm -hmm. dark series. Um, oh, so he's trying to say something here. Um, I think he was trying to say something, but but not... Not like a suicide note. Um, anyway, so they try and the the Van Gogh. I don't know if I want to say apologist, but those who are trying to trying to create this impression of the, the suicide narrative. That's a great painting to sort of go whoa. whoa, whoa. Uh, look look at what's going on here, right? And I actually love that painting. I've also got that painting in my bedroom, and uh, I've been wanting to put that behind me as the background, but I don't think we're quite there yet. But I'll probably, maybe I'll put it up for, for the next live. But so that's the one thing. The other thing is when you are in Auvers and you do the tour in, in the Revue Inn, then the, the speech that they've got prepared, the speech that they, they say to all the tourists is, uh, you know, like they're trying to say what happened, and then it sort of ends up saying, oh, and, you know, so these are all the reasons he committed suicide, and then, you know, the last picture he painted um, was wheat filled with crows, and it's like, no, it's not. It's not the last picture he painted. And so it's like, do you not know that? Like, do you not know that that's not the last picture he painted? But, you know, so in other words, they will keep emphasizing that painting, but they won't say, yes, but he painted other paintings as well. That one, that one, that one, that one. Right. So they, they kind of create this impression that 
that it all fits totally nicely together and then it's 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 very it's pretty open and shut and the, and it's not i just thought it was interesting that even bailey notes when it was actually painted as yeah with yeah as one of the three large landscapes in the three days that was one of them so that was his response Karina says keep going sorry i was just saying that was part of his response when he went home and he was getting all his emotions out some people go talk to someone for for therapy other people mm. write vincent paints it's, he finds it therapeutic and that's what he did Karina says he could have painted the crows from the total opposite point of view of the crows flying off like his dark thoughts. So rather positive. Um, she says something about Native American culture. Um, Nisi says the rumor keeps it more interesting, I believe. Yeah. PW, the facts don't fit the suicide narrative, so they are misrepresented. So where I kind of feel a bit of dismay is you know, I'm interested in Van Gogh. I'm, I've got Dutch heritage. My, my great-grandfather was actually invited into the palace by the Queen of Holland or whatever. So, you know, I've got that heritage in a way. And so I'm positively predisposed towards the Netherlands. And then I go to the Van Gogh Museum and it's like, this feels a bit tricksy and a bit mischievous. It feels like you're manipulating people. And are you telling me you don't know this yourself? You know, it's one thing where you just either dumb or ignorant, but it's another where you know better, but you're like, we're gonna, we, we're gonna, we're gonna say that and not that, you know, and I kind of have a problem with that because you're basically making money out of selling a lie and that's something we see in true crime all the time right and so is that happening in this case are you making money selling a lie and then you've also got, kind of got to ask are the art experts that work for you are they just totally do they just have tunnel vision or are they kind of on the payroll you know uh, they are employed by the Van Gogh Museum as long as they support a particular narrative. Or, and bear in mind, um, Van Gogh is worth millions and millions and millions. So if you are, are on the good side of that equation, you're going to do pretty well, right? If you persona non grata, which I think I am, <laughs> uh, then we, we actually don't know that, you know, it's like, I don't, have you seen um, Shrek where Shrek kind of wants a volunteer and the donkey jumps up and says, me, me, pick me, 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 pick me. You, have you seen that? Yeah. So yeah, I'm kind of like that. that. I'm kind of like that at the Van Gogh Museum. It's like, hi, I mean, hi, I mean, hi, I've, I've written a book. Hi, hi, hi. And they're like, Sorry, is there someone there? I thought I heard something. Yes, me, me, me. I, I wrote something. Can I please talk about it? Uh, next, next. Oh. It's, it's not very fortuitous <laughs> for them to advertise your narr your narrative that you researched. Yeah, but it takes so. Than art, art experts. It also, you know, what about history experts and true crime experts and there's so many different pieces that go into his life. What I've found as a true crime author is this pattern of us lying to ourselves where, where we, in so many different areas, we as a species lie to ourselves. And what I mean is, if you take Van, Van Gogh, he's, he's one of the most beloved artists in the world. He's one of the most famous artists in the world. He's one of the most popular and well-known and well-loved artists. And it seems like his story is largely a con, a lie. Um, you know, and it's almost like 
But but what's the harm in that? People like to believe he was this troubled artist. Well, I can tell you now, Van Gogh was sitting here right now. And you said, how do you feel? Do you think it's like, what's the harm in that? What's the harm if people thought you committed suicide when you didn't? You know, what would he say? Uh, I don't think he'd say, mm, um, but that is something we've kind of got to address is because ultimately he does say something like, don't blame any, to the police. He says, don't believe anyone else or, or don't accuse anyone else. And so you've got to ask this question, what's going on there? Why would he say that if, if he didn't, uh, uh, you know, if, if um, someone shot him, why would he put that on himself? And that's, again, where you've got to come to this thing of, well, do you know Van Gogh very well? And that's where this is really important. So yeah. let me ask you a question, Stephanie. Do you think, do you think the family visit, probably a bit of a tricky question in a way, but do you think the family visit is relevant to the circumstances of his death? The circumstances of his death? I don't think they caused his death, but I think the theme of Vincent not wanting to be a burden might have been part of the reason why he would have taken the suicide upon himself, looking out for his family. Well, I I think the him not wanting to be a burden is true, meaning he was feeling that, right? Yes, and he didn't, so, want to, he didn't want to be, but I don't think that that's why, I don't think he killed himself because of that. I think he would. But, but think of it like be. this. Think of it like this. He shot. He, he didn't kill himself. Someone has shot him. Mm -hmm. We're saying that it's Dr. Gachet, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the context is we know that Theo's, business is kind of hanging on by a thread. We know that Theo's work situation is not great. We know that Theo is kind of in a bit of a dire strait financially, right? And now his brother's, his brother's already been shot. And if it is by Dr. Gachet, is Vincent going to say, someone who could be your best client shot me. He's in big trouble now. Um, bring the police and I'm accusing him and let's have a court case and um, it's us against Dr. Gachet. Or is he saying in a weird way, you know what, it's my fault, I'm sorry, don't blame anyone. Um, you know what I'm saying? So in other words, he doesn't want to be a burden on his brother and he would especially not want his brother to lose the potential thing of in the same way, he didn't want to lose Gorga as a as a patron or as a yeah as a client, um, and I think it's an absolute repeat of that. He had this big uh, Gorga really was trying to get the hell away from Vincent, and yet that he still preserved the relationship with between Gorga and Theo. In fact, Theo came to fetch Gorga and kind of took him home and was like, "Please, just let's let's let's." Um, you know, let's patch things up, and they did. And so, with isn't it the same with Dr. Gachet? Vincent does something, Dr. Gachet does something, and then Vincent's like, sorry, it's my fault, don't hurt Theo, you know, don't take us out on Theo, all my fault, I'm to blame. And you might say, that doesn't make any sense, but his background was, he, he became a lay pastor, and he, he worked in the Borinage, he went down into the mines with the peasants, he would make sketches and and um, and to keep himself warm, he would burn the sketch that he just made, and he was he was living like a tramp, and so he, he kind of went through this phase where he was very much into the Emile Zola, um, Charles Dickens um, idea of you know where you um, poor and that makes you heroic. Do you know what I mean? That idea of suffering 
imbues you with a kind of saintliness. And so that is why um, I think well, God depicted him as a martyr, as, as like the, this Christ figure. I don't know if you, did you ever look at that picture I showed you of yeah, I this? Gene? Yeah, and I think it's, I think it is, um, the title of it is something like Gorga in the Garden of Eden, but it, or Gorga in the Garden or something, but it's a man with ginger hair. And Gorga didn't have ginger hair. So right. you've got to think about who he was actually painting there. And I, I, I seem to remember that the idea that, that he was actually trying to depict Van Gogh as this martyr figure, I think that actually came from a documentary. I didn't like look at that and say, oh, that's something that another art expert recognized. And I agree with that. So you've kind of got this martyr, martyr thing going on here. And so if he does get shot, does that explain why he, he doesn't um, just blame somebody else kind of thing? In you know? that sense, he's taking the ultimate burden upon himself and trying to take that part away from yeah. Leo having to deal and his family having the aftermath of the loss of yeah, I mean, even when he, it's quite funny in a way, but even when he was in this relationship with a pregnant prostitute, he didn't make her pregnant. So, you know, it's like he really got the short end of the stick there. He's, he's, he's sort of, he falls in love with this pregnant prostitute and she dumps him. I mean, talk about someone who's like a glutton for punishment. <laughs> And I mean, you know, uh, it's like he's trying to look after this pregnant prostitute and she's like, Van Gogh, you are, you, you're not good enough for me. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to dump you. Uh, I know you're trying to look after me, but I, there's, there's, there's more comfort for me out there in the streets. Yeah. Oh, my God. But I'm just saying it shows you to what extent he can make himself a doormat, you know. So Karina says, I do not believe that Vincent committed suicide at all. PW says, hope of success sprang eternal for B Vincent Van Gogh. And to be honest, his hope came to great fruition. I, I don't know if he was really hoping for success. I kind of get the feeling, in a way, the fact that he painted as much might be, might be a sign of that. But I kind of get the feeling... It's almost like he just put his head down and he's just like, I'm going to paint. And he, he didn't really know what was going to happen with it, in a way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think it's true. I mean, I, I wrote 101 books. You know, I think if you ask me, um, do I think I'm going to be a failure? I would have said, no, well, I do hope that I'm going to have success. Am I, do I think that's realistic? I would have said, maybe not. But... The hope is there. I think there's got to be that hope for the artist to continue the creation, you know. So I guess that, that is quite a good point. Um, but that's also the argument for why he didn't commit suicide is if there was hope, if the reason that, that artists create is to do with hope and faith and belief and courage and... Um, confidence, then, then then he had all of those things up until the day that he died. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like he suddenly lost hope, you know. With Brian Laundry, Brian suddenly lost hope because he'd lost kind of everything. He'd lost the love of his life and he was actually responsible for it. He didn't see a future for himself. You had this unique circumstance and you can't really argue with it. He, he did. He had lost everything. You know what did what did he have to to live for? And so, but the, the the issue is that this was a unique circumstance for Brian. You would ask the question: What is the unique circumstance for Van Gogh? So you say, oh, his brother couldn't look after him anymore. No, an inheritance had been put aside for him. What is the unique? situation for Van Gogh. Um, 
uh, his family was sick. No, they got healthy. They they weren't like they were sick in early July, not late July. Um, what's the unique? Circle? Well, he couldn't sell any of his art. No, he could never sell any of his art throughout. Um, what's the unique circumstance? Um, he was depressed and he just got more and more. No, 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 he actually was quite happy in Orbez. He was he was enjoying it and it, it was a nice place and he said it over and over again. And then if you say, okay, it wasn't suicide, it was murder, what's the unique circumstance? You say, couldn't it have been Marguerite Gachet? This person that we know he was painting at the time, we know he said, I want to paint her again. And there's this funny little story around the very last time that he did paint her where he painted her, but he tore the picture and then he threw it away. That doesn't make sense. And that story took 71 years to come to light. Right? That's the unique circumstance around that. Yeah, I was, so, was going to say or, or there, yeah. but definitely Marguerite. Yeah. Um, have you um, done everything you need to do with your nephew? No. Speaking of of sick nephews, my nephew is ill. Oh. So not just, you know, I don't think. Is he at your home? No. I was going to go visit him this morning, and I didn't okay. get to do that because he's sick. So. Are you going to go this afternoon? No, my sister told me not to come because he wasn't feeling uh -huh. very well. He was just sleeping a lot and uh, okay. And now, now, even that's quite an interesting analogy. Um, sometimes when you're sick, it's better that someone doesn't come around because it's like they need to rest. Um, they need a quiet sort of household kind of thing. And so Vincent going to... So just think about it. He goes to visit his brother and all these friends are there. But meanwhile, there are these serious issues going on and they're probably not terribly thrilled by it, if you know what I mean. So so all of these people come there and, you know, it's kind of Vincent's friends. But there are these other issues going on and it's, it's like Vincent's sort of like the victim in this thing. It's like, okay, we let's get some friends to talk to Vincent. Meanwhile, there, there are these other things going on. And they, they, they didn't know that that was going to be the case. They didn't know that um, these things were going to catch up with them at the same time. And so Vincent obviously caught wind of it and then was, was dragged into it. But then he, you know, they dealt with it kind of thing. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pull my curtain because it's like... Yeah, I see the lights, the lights are <laughs> falling over you. <laughs> Um, so chapter 12 is double squares, which I'm not going to deal with here. Thanks, um, He's two. The, the only thing that I did um, underline here was on page 108 where he says, the double square canvases can be seen as a summation of Van Gogh's late work, at least in terms of landscapes. These are among his most ambitious paintings, all completed within the last four weeks of his stay. Three of them, wheat fields with crows, farms near Obez, and tree roots, have at different times been considered to be his very last painting. So uh, there you kind of have it. We know that wheat fields with crows wasn't his last painting, um, but you never see them talking about Farms near Orvez. Let's just see if I can find it there. Farms near Orvez. Oh, I have terrible lighting. Don't go by me. Can't That's actually find that looks, farms. That, it's on page 113. That one actually looks like it's not that finished. Yeah. So this is one of the paintings that's supposed to be one of his last paintings. And you can imagine that... If you put that up as his last painting, you'd be like, um, so, like, what? So what, yeah. what am I supposed to be seeing here? Um, the tree roots works quite well. It's like he's drawing roots 
And so this is Lars painting. Now, what I find quite funny, and it's something maybe to go into later on, um, and I think uh, Bailey does this actually, but there's now this all this excitement that, and it's kind of come out in the last year or so that, oh, no, 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 they found now, this is the painting that Van Gogh painted. That's his last painting. It's the tree roots. Mm. You, you, nobody really knows what the last painting was. Yeah. You know what I mean? But now it's like, this is the last painting. Okay, so now I guess let's, let's make tree roots worth $200 million because that's the last painting. Yeah. But, but hold on. 20 years ago, it was wheat filled with crows. Okay, no, no, but now we're going to make another painting. Oh, okay. Now let's all get excited about this being the last painting. 10 years from now, new information has come out that this is very likely the last painting. Okay, great. Okay. It's a little bit like in the Madeleine McCann case, who's the suspect of the year or of the month? Um, and it's like, okay, so do we have amnesia? We forget everything we know and then... We have some, like an exciting, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, an exciting exhibition. And we all chatter about that. But does really matter what the truth is? So Van Gogh, Van Gogh he mentions the wheat field with crows in one of his letters. Not Not specifically, but we know that that was one of the three that he painted in those days after his visit to Paris. What's interesting is that farms near Orver was never mentioned in any letter. Yeah. And that makes me think he didn't have a chance. If Absolutely. it wasn't finished, it's possible he didn't have a chance to talk about it at all. And it's a pretty, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, it, it lo does look a little unfinished, but it's a really nice little, painting of yeah. the farmland and the countryside so I would be the problem that. is the problem is it's nondescript so if you're trying to say there's this dramatic moment and there's this dramatic whatever then you know what I mean um, the other thing that I think is quite interesting is you might say farms near Obez is just to totally nondescript it means nothing but the fact is is painting lots of little houses. And so how far was he from Dr. Gachet's home when he painted that? You know, did he paint that and go and have lunch at Dr. Gachet, right? To me, um, I think it's just very interesting that he speaks about wanting to paint Marguerite Gachet. Paul Gachet says that he did come there to paint it, but he sort of, and then he's got this crazy story where he, does something and then he tears it and he throws it away and he's not interested. Yeah, right. Like that happened. That's like, so, it, it's like a soap opera. To me, the fact that he expresses to his brother that I want to paint her again, that is more um, important. Do you know what I mean? The other thing is, wouldn't he have gone to paint her on a Sunday? Um, that was his typical family yeah. going to dinner day with. So Asian. maybe it was a situation where he was invited to lunch or something. Was and then it he. One day that he is, that it was said that he was shot. It was a Sunday. Yeah. So okay. maybe he was invited for lunch and he kind of overstayed his welcome. You know what I mean? He. Um, he didn't just come have lunch. He then, like, oh, I'm also going to paint Marguerite now. And then could have been that Dr. Gachet had other plans, so he's going to go fishing. And you'll actually see in Bailey's book, Bailey says something like that, that when, when Vincent was shot, Dr. Gachet was on the other side of the river fishing, um, which is quite a funny explanation. You know what I mean? Like, oh, he was yeah. fishing. And you kind of got to ask, did, was, did he fish all the time? And also, the fact that he was on the other side of the river, it's like, you might as well say he was on the other side of France. Oh, so, he, so are you telling me he, was, he wasn't in the picture? 
Oh, I, I, I got it. Okay. On Sunday. You, you, you're not going to tell me that he was fishing on this side of the river. Oh, he was on the other side. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, we're gonna we're still going to deal with that. Um, th this chapter thirteen is dealing with the last picture. And what's really interesting with this is you've got to almost compare it to the last Instagram post of Gabby Petit and Brian Laundry is to, to say, what, what is he thinking when he's painting these pictures? What is he thinking when he's writing these letters? Because we know about the last letters and the last pictures. And once again, you've got to say, what is going on? Is he about to be murdered or is he about to commit suicide? And if you say... Um, if you say, well, he's about to commit suicide, well, where's the evidence in those letters? And if you say, well, there's no evidence in the letters, then it's starting to push you towards not suicide. Yeah. And then you've got to start figuring out something that hasn't been figured out before. Um, he seems like he's busy making plans in his letters. He's planning to do yeah. that. Okay, well, I think that is about it. I just want to see if there's anything I left out here. Um, I, I just put a circle around the word delighted on page 97. Vincent caught an early train and he would have been delighted to see his nephew. So again, he's delighted. He's not miserable. He did have an argument, but once again, he's happy. And he saw a lot of friends. Next line, he would have been pleased to see um, I guess some of his earlier paintings when he went to visit there. And then all of these friends dropped by. So even though it was a bit of a setback in terms of they had this argument, he also has quite a pleasant experience. He sees all these friends that he knows, and ultimately they get over the, the problem that it is. Yeah. I uh, I Vincent enjoyed a morbid joke. Sorry? I said I wish I had written it down because I was going um, over the letters. I, um, I think it's vangoletters.org. Uh, and I was, one of the letters Vincent had written after his visit, and it wasn't the one that was his response to Joe. He actually wrote like a PS at the end. And it said, I had a lovely time with my friends making memories or something like that. Mm -hmm. He actually wrote that. Hmm. Um, Theo's issue if, so, so now you want to say Theo is going through this horrible time he was feeling that he's not being properly rewarded not that he's not being rewarded he's getting a salary, he's employed he just thought I'm not getting paid enough and ultimately he stayed in his job and nothing really changed so um, if anything, Theo's in quite a good place to say, you know what, I'm worth more than this. And a in a weird way, his brother was in the same place. His brother was thinking, I'm worth more than this as well. You know, it's not, it's not like they are, it's not a destructive spiral. The other thing, just to be accurate, is you might say, the moving apartments was going to be this big crisis because Vincent was going to possibly lose all the work that he'd accumulated. Well, they were moving to an apartment in the same building. So, you know, in terms of stress, yes, it's stressful, but it's not it's not this big catastrophe. It's just moving in somewhere else in the same building. Yeah. I do think that a big issue was... Um, Theo, Joe, and the baby spending their summer in Orvez or going to the Netherlands. Vincent was desperate. These are Bailey's words. Vincent was desperately keen for them to come to Orvez, but Theo and Joe were under pressure to return to Holland. That I agree 100% with, is that he would have felt very disappointed. He was enjoying, he, he really, the, the visit that they did to Orvez for him was this wonderful thing and he wanted it to happen again and again and he probably thought I mean who wouldn't he, he's moved from the south of France to just an hour outside 
Paris and he's thinking, well, my brother's going to come visit me every other weekend. And then another weekend pass, he doesn't visit and then they're sick. And then there's this problem and, and then that had to be disappointing. And I think he was lonely. So he's got to be thinking, I'm really lonely. You know, I've got some friends here, but I'd really like to see my family. They're only an hour away. Why are they not coming to visit me? You can definitely see that being the case. Yeah, that would be disappointing. Yeah. Um, Karina says, not to forget the positive art critics visit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Margaret Zabinski says, Stephanie, you are amazing. You're an amazing true crime rock scientist. Oh, thank you. Sorry about the rocky start. I always, in the beginning, am super nervous. And then I... Really? Like, yeah. I like shuffle my notes and and then you went missing and I was like, oh. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. I just saw two circles and I thought as my internet timed out, then I went completely out and actually thought I've lost the broadcast. And when I went back in, I'm like, wow, you're still talking like nothing happened. Okay. Aw, thank you, Susan. That Thanks, so Susan. I feel like I feel like I've got to split that with you, Stephanie. No. I think when I when I come to America, I'll, I'll buy you a, a, a beer or a wine or whatever. And, you know, I owe you a birthday drink. That. A birthday drink. Are When's you your birthday? Are you coming to CrimeCon? Um, I don't think so. I feel a bit snubbed. <laughs> I understand. I think they said. We can only have John Ramsey or True Crime Rockets. So we've got to choose between the two. And they said, let's go with John Ramsey. Yeah. So the yeah. next chapter we're going to do is um, the last picture. And so we are now moving into the end game, the, the final few weeks of, of his life. By the way, this is another one that they say – could be the last picture. This one over here. This one here. Could be the one of the last pictures. Mm -hmm. That one's not very dark either. It's got yeah. a lot of cloud, like white puffy clouds. So what I've written above each picture, I've written over here. Um, quite weird when I've, I've written over this one. Sorry, uh, this one. Um, finished. This is a finished picture. I don't think it's signed. Whereas this one is unfinished and unsigned. So obviously it's a giveaway. The picture hasn't been signed. Um, picture? It's page 114. And then the chapter after that is shot. Right, so we are now getting into the the end of this discussion. Uh, so the next chapter will be the last picture that he did, and then we deal with final hours. And you can see there's used we filled with crows opposite final hours. And I mean, he said early in his own book that he we filled with crows was was painted in early July. And then final hours. So it's just quite interesting how that's done. Um, and this is where it gets really interesting when you talk about how this art expert sees the final hours, um, the funeral. Also, like, what is what does Dr. Gachet do and whatever? And then we're going to deal with what he says about suicide or murder. So the, the Martin Bailey himself uh, makes the case almost like a investigator. These are these are my reasons for it being. This is an art expert. He knows Van Gogh through and through. These are my reasons why it's suicide, not murder. And by the time we get there, we need to be. Um, we need to know our game to say, yeah, that makes sense or that doesn't. So. So that's that's where we're going with all of this. Uh, yeah, I got I took the cover off. Hold on, let me grab it. It's 
It's called Van Gogh's Finale. Yeah, it's a hardcover book. Um, and I took the flap off because I didn't want it to get ruined. Because it's a beautiful and it's book. It's by Martin it's Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y. Hold on. There we go. I'm really hoping my book's going to get a 24th review before the end of the series. Intent. Yeah. Karina says Nick H. Bailey Nord. Okay, that's Karina's opinion. Um, oh, few. I didn't. I didn't turn anyone against your, <laughs> your <laughs> yeah. narrative. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Yeah, one thing that I feel like I may not have succeeded in is presenting Bailey's narrative um, as is in a way and then saying this is his position and then saying, well, I disagree with that and that and that and then sort of leaving it at that, you know. Um, maybe I'm, I'll, maybe I'm going to try and do that in the next couple of episodes where yeah. I'm going to just present what he says and then tick without them. sort of nitpicking yeah. each one and then at the end say, well, I don't think that's a net. And then you can say, I actually think the art expert knows what he's talking about. Or you say, actually, you've got a point there. But I, I wanted to be quite clear that this is his narrative. Does it actually make sense given what we know? That's really what you're trying to get at. Yeah. Um, so I haven't finished the book, so... I'm still taking it, you know, I, I'm a, like a chapter. I'm at chapter. Oh, haven't you finished it? No. Okay. I'm a, <laughs> I, I've been doing it as we read it. Oh, really? That's interesting. You're going to, you're in for a treat because the next chapters are definitely, uh, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what your position, there's some fascinating stuff in it. So it's definitely going to be quite interesting. Um, Karina says you will get a glowing review from me, exclamation mark. I'm almost done reading your book. It is awesome. That's so good to see. I'm really looking forward to it. So if you do leave a review, um, please sort of motivate your, motivate your review. Say what you liked, what surprised you, what you agreed with, also what you didn't agree with. What also what you didn't like, if there's something like that. Um, but yeah, looking forward to reading reading it. Um, Nisi says almost done with book for review. Okay, is that Bailey's book? <laughs> no. Oh, PW just started your book, Nick. I must say, what's really nice about this is that you guys are so invested and committed. Like even Stephanie. I didn't ask Stephanie to buy the book, and it's quite expensive. I think it's like thirty-three dollars. It's really great to see you guys on board, enthusiastic, learning, but also just getting a kick out of it yourselves. Like, you know, we don't have to just kind of sit back and say, "Wow, Van Gogh," um, you know, uh, okay, spoon feed me the information. You can kind of go, "I know quite a lot about this, and I'm making my own opinion." And it's, it's so important to reach that point where you you don't accept a reality that's given to you, you critical think your way to what is likely, right? I was saying earlier just that as, as a true crime writer, I've just been so shocked by um, how far people are from knowing certain realities in certain cases. Right now, the Barry Morphew case, it's like either Barry Morphew did something or big question mark, it's this big sort of vague fog, right? But nevertheless, his daughters seem to believe him, right? But you take that and then you look at, for example, what's going on in Ukraine. What's the reality there? And, and it's done purposefully. People manipulate reality. Even the good guys, so you might say Ukraine are the good guys, they're also manipulating reality. Yeah, um, so it's really important to be able to figure out what reality is. Uh, it's good for you. It's 
not good to just go to to read the news, to read about these cases and and not think critically. I just before I came on this this live stream, um, I was having dinner and, and I was just sort of watching um, I think it's called Worst Roommate Ever or something like that. Worst other worst roommate or worst housemate or worst neighbor. And it's about the one episode that I watched was about Dorothea Puentes or something. She buried nine. She she was an old uh, a, a sort of woman who presented herself as this old lady. She wasn't actually that old. And she drugged, I think, seven of her tenants and took their, um, what do you call them, social security checks, buried seven of these people in her garden. She poisoned them to death, you know, like putting in sleeping pills in their drinks and whatever. And, you know, like this, you'd think it's a homeless old lady, but she actually was like a serial killer. She killed nine people. And what, what's happening there is people aren't, people are, 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 are too trusting and she's taking advantage of that. You know, it's like, it's, it's people who are, um, you know, she's giving them, she's influencing them, but also looking, oh, uh, you, uh, and they say that she got a total of about $100,000 from cashing their social security checks, which I don't know if that's a lot of money, but nine lives yeah. and you get $100,000. Gathering Places, I saw that on Netflix. What I'm trying to get at is, if you knew reality, that could could either save your life or somebody else's life. And in the case of that particular case, um, you had a social worker who got told that the person that she'd brought to this shelter, you know, this house, she got told, no, he's gone to Mexico, and she just wouldn't accept that. She was like, he wouldn't do that. And then she 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 was kind of like the Nicole Atkinson of, of this. Um, then she was told, okay, no, he'll be back on Monday or something like that. And then she's, or, or, um, I think she said, if he's not back on Monday, I'm phoning the police. And then on the Monday, she got a call from someone saying, you know what? Um, he came here, but his family picked him up and, and he's left again. And she just didn't accept that. She was kind of like Nicole Atkinson. And, and then it turned out that he had been murdered. But her her being so convinced that uh, and not not being persuaded by this manipulative woman um, was the beginning of stopping all of these murders from taking place. And so it just every person that can think critically stops this the momentum of 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 us being lying to ourselves. You know what I mean? Whether it's wars or uh, the coronavirus or whatever, it really helps all of us if we can be honest. It helps us. We we think it's you know you being a downer or you you um, you just being unfairly whatever negative or something. Actually, you're helping everybody by stopping that path of least resistance nonsense kind of thing. And then jail. Yeah, look, she um, she buried, I think, seven people in her garden. And I think she used lime or something to destroy their bodies. So they were like skeletons, but, yeah, it's a very small garden as well. Um, Karina says, always trust your instincts and always engage your brain. Yeah. Stephanie, I think that's it for for us. Um, two hours. Um, it's half past ten. I'm. Do I look tired? I'm. I'm definitely. I'm feeling pretty tired. No, not really. Don't I? Okay. I'm thinking of going for my booster tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. Good. Have you been yeah. triple vaccinated? Yeah, for a while now. Since I work in the pharmacy. A lot are, of are you? In, so. Is there the option of getting a fourth booster? Um, 
you you can, but I don't think that it's. I, I mean, I I don't I don't know what the World Health Organization is saying about it yet. Uh, some people who are in immunocompromised oh, yeah. have gotten it, um, but I don't know a lot of people that have. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit concerned because in South Africa, they want to suspend masks and whatever. And I don't think it's a good idea doing it just before our winter, you know? Yes, yeah, so um, we're doing that now, but it's going into spring for us. Yeah. And it's interesting, my, my children's, our school district, you have the option to wear a mask or not now it's literally just a couple days that it's been a choice and my older son who's in high school is like free the face maskless he's so excited to see his peers and his teachers and then my younger one who's in fourth grade who's had a mask for two years he wants to, he feels like it's his safety net he does yeah he's still for sure weird. yeah it's interesting that well, i can't imagine i can't imagine like going into german because gym, um, I don't know, they are, we definitely wear it going in and, and leaving. Um, I, I, I must say, like, I'm so used to uh, sanitizing my hands when you go to the grocery store. I feel like if they take that away, it's going to be kind of dirty in a way. You know, what's wrong with just sanitizing your hands? Yeah, I have the, the sanitizing wipes for the carts and the hand sanitizer. Well, Terry Dean says, I live near Sacramento. I think there was also a story like that in Canada. He put the bodies in garden planters. I'm not sure which one that is, but it's quite amazing that you're near Sacramento. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's quite amazing with that lady was she, she her, her parents both died when she was quite young, so one wonders what happened there. I suspect that she inherited money and sort of thinking of when somebody dies, you can you you can get money. Just that idea. You know, if, when there's a death, you can liquidate the finance or whatever. And then she became a prostitute, which was further the transactionality of people, a person that's basically an ATM. And then she kind of made herself out to be like a grandmother like this harmless old lady but she's actually younger than she actually was she kind of put these big glasses on and kind of looked a bit like this frumpy old lady but she's actually younger and obviously deadlier as a result kind of thing um yeah i just want to touch on something that might be of interest to some people um my girlfriend had a booster shot about a week ago and she had a horrible side effect. She, she, she was very sick. She had like fever. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't want to go near. I was like, I don't want to get COVID. Um, but, um, and I think people who have that sort of thing of, you see, um, uh, you know, they're not safe. It's, it's, it's uh, the side effects are horrible. Uh, blah, blah, blah. She had virtually no side effects with the first jab, virtually none with the second. And then with the third one, very serious side effects. She had like a headache. She had fever. She felt terrible. I think she even took off work two or three days. But she actually had an underlying infection when she had the booster. She had like some kind of, um, I think, bladder infection or something, like a bacterial infection. And so that was undermining her immunity in a quite a serious way at the time she had the booster. Now, bear in mind, the booster is actually undermining your immunity anyway, but in a way that that helps your defenses. But if it's already undermined, then that's kind of what happens. And people think, oh, no, no, it's the jab that's got side effects. No, the jab's doing what it's supposed to do. You should know, or, you know, to be fair, you should – try and just have it when you are healthy. And I actually was going to go at the same time she went and I felt, I actually don't feel that well. I actually had a bit of a 
cough and I didn't feel that great. Do you remember when I didn't do that live? Yeah. Um, where I cancelled the live. I actually wasn't feeling that great. And you, you've got to be healthy when you have it. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. Because it is undermining your immunity to get a response from it. And people then hold that up and say, oh, no, there's something wrong with the, the jab or, you know what I mean? But you've got to see it in context. You've got to absolutely to see it in context. Madeline Jimenez says there's a movie called Arsenic and Lace about two elderly ladies killing borders. Oh my is that another one? Gee. I don't Sharon know, I don't Tuck watch says, too many yeah. movies. <laughs> I don't get to watch too many movies because for my free time away from family, I'm participating or reading. Or Thanks, Stephanie. I don't watch, I don't watch a lot of movies. Uh, and the ones I do watch are like, you mentioned before, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen Shrek because they're kid movies. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not very good with movie intertextualities because I haven't seen a lot of them, them recently. Uh, Sharon says, I thought I was going to die after the vaccine and the two boosters. Wow, that's, yeah. that's pretty I have three different pretty side effects. I, the first one, I had the COVID arm that developed about two or three weeks after the vaccine. The second time I was really exhausted. Um, and then the third, I, I felt like very extremely achy enough that I took pain relief because it, it wasn't just the arm ache, it was like a full body ache. Mm. But I've seen a lot. I did, I just saw arm. Yeah. I've, we've had client um, customers who have so many that have lost family members to COVID that I I just it's just so sad. It's so sad. How's your dad? He's good. It's he's it's not as chaotic anymore. It's kind of like the parents who are choosing to vaccinate their children now are getting their second shot. Okay. So it's it's uh, slowing down. It's not as chaotic, which is, is is good. Yeah, I think when you were going through that stressful period, it was like part of the winter mm -hmm. peak hour kind of thing, the peak yeah. season. Yep. And so, in a in a way, you could just take heart that as the season changes, that curve is going to change. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's been good chatting to you. Um, I actually didn't prepare much for this. I mean, I did go through the chapter, I did the highlight stuff, but I didn't write a script out. Yeah. And you, you kind of caught me out with that first thing with the, the quote when that actually came out, like that that um, your 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 research had actually um, kind of trumped that. So. It's actually we. I think we make quite a good team. You you're pretty accurate and you're pretty. Um, you what's the word? You um, not comprehensive. You 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 go through the whole thing. You, you don't leave little pieces out. Yeah, conscientious. Yeah, but, but you you have you are preparing for a lot more live streams and write, you know, patron posts and I'm just doing one an episode <laughs> once every yeah. week or two. So. But today was particularly busy for a Sunday, just particularly busy. It started with a live, then I went to the gym and cycled, then I swam. Um, I won't take you through everything, but I mean, then I made a video of Nicole Kessinger and this is the, this is essentially the third video in one day. Um, uh, but I actually did think instead of putting a script, I would like to hear what you got to say. And, and the question is really, in terms of this particular chapter, do you think this made him suicidal? And I, I kind of wanted you to independently, I don't want to influence you, I wanted you to kind of independently answer that. You know? And I think it's just, it's not, it's not um, rocket science, it's not like this very 50 50 thing it's quite obvious that that um 
he wasn't going through like serious, serious crises. He wasn't depressed. Yeah. You know? His own words, his letters are evidence. Yeah. But you have to look at them all. Yeah. yeah. So if at Terry I, I, is your, yeah. I was gonna say I can't uh, just I really found the um, the Van Gogh letters dot org and they translate them. It's 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 amazing, and you can like put in keywords or a date, and it will bring up that letter. So yeah, what no, I did is, yeah. yeah, what I did is I um will look at the end notes, and it will mark the letter that he's referring to. So then I go and I read what the letter is, and then I say, well, that's a different interpretation than I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another archive of of these letters i think it's called web exhibits and um that's that's also a very good one sometimes the so letters exhibits van gogh or just i think if you just if you just google van gogh and web exhibits to come up okay. or letters web, letters van gogh web, web exhibits um but um i think i think that that is like a grid that shows like on a year and months when he wrote letters and you, you actually see how you like write a lot of letters and then not that many. And then, but anyway, so the last couple of months he did really write a lot of letters compared to it was much, it was like uh, the higher than average, I guess. Mm -hmm. So he was quite communicative in the, the last months. Um, what is quite interesting is sometimes the same letter is analyzed on both sides and then you see how they they differ you know it's obviously the translation somebody makes a decision okay that word means that and it, it's just quite interesting it's kind of almost like apocrypha you know it's like in the bible one bible will will have that um kind of version of a verse and another one is kind of different you know um, and and it's, it's just once again, um, you you actually got to make up your mind what the reality is. What is he actually trying to communicate? But you only get that when you get to know him. When you get to know him, you realize well that area of concern is either relevant or or it's not. And sometimes you might say, well, this is really really important, and we just don't know what he actually meant there. Anyway. Um, a couple of people just saying thanks very much. Terry says you're a great team. Thank you both for your valuable time. PW, thank you, Nick and Stephanie, for your insights. Sharon, thank you. Thank you guys for being here. I think we're going to wrap up now. Stephanie, um, I think I'm going to do the next chapter solo. Um, I think we should do another one with you. Uh, you want to do final hours. Or do you want to do shot? It's so just let me know if you want to do chapter 14 or chapter 15. Okay. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm just letting you guys know, those, those out there watching, the next four or five chapters are really dealing, starting to deal with the very last day. And so um, we are now dealing with the actual crime, the crime scene and all that. This is the area where we excel as true crime rocket scientists. So if, if there's anywhere where we're going to start seeing either Martin Bailey pull ahead of us or we pull ahead of him, it's in this area where he either knows a lot about the details that we don't know or um, we we have the ability to intuit the crime scene better than somebody who doesn't know that much about crime. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, let's just read the last ones. PW, blessings on all until we meet again. Patty, thanks, Patty. Madeline, agree with you, Nick. Go, go when you're well, thanks. Uh, that's true. Robbie, sorry I missed most of it. Too bad, Robbie. Madeline, it's a movie from the 1940s. Oh, that's a arsenic and um what's it arsenic and 
something else. Can't find it now. Arsenic, arsenic and, and old lace. Arsenic and old lace. Oh, arsenic and old lace. Yeah, that actually sounds very appropriate. Okay, guys. Um, Stephanie, I hope you have a good Sunday afternoon. I'm going to dreamland. Uh, thank you to the 50 folks who are watching. It's for me um, great to have quite a. Uh, I'm very appreciative for the number of you who are interested in this topic. Um, it's not better than five. Faces and names okay. now. I love the familiar faces and names. Getting yeah. To all the people. It's really nice. I don't know if there were any members that joined now, were there? I, I, I'm not quite not sure. But uh, gathering place, good to have you here. Um, yeah, so I'll probably, the next live will probably be uh, around about this time. I uh, don't know how many of the mods can make it, but it'll be probably about 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday, dealing with Barry Morphew. So I, d I just really want to get through Barry Morphew before I go yeah. away. And I'm not going to be here that much longer. So um, there's quite a lot to go through still with Barry Morphy with yeah, those versions. It took us but, two hours to go through, I think, nine pages yesterday because there's just yeah. so much. So if you multiply uh, that yeah. by... Yeah. yeah. Now, there's a lot to do. So I feel like I have to do like twice a week for, for a while. Anyway... Um, Thanks again for joining me. Thanks for your prep, Stephanie. Thanks for the mods that have been in chat. And I'll see you guys next time. See you, Stephanie. Thank you. Good night. Ciao. Okay, thanks. Take care. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.